Bonjour, bonsoir, bon après-midi à tous et bienvenue dans ce nouvel épisode d'Histoire de Mec ou plutôt devrais-je dire « Welcome in this new episode of my podcast » puisque cette interview est la première que je fais tout en anglais. Alors merci Davos pour votre indulgence comme vous l'avez entendu à propos de mon anglish que je pratique beaucoup trop peu depuis une dizaine d'années. C'était compliqué d'avoir une discussion aussi fluide qu'avec mes autres invités dans la langue de Shakespeare, vous vous en doutez, ou de répondre aussi naturellement que d'habitude pour moi. Au-delà de mon anglais « very Frenchy, je suis vraiment ravi de pouvoir vous proposer cette discussion avec Jerry Hyde, qui est thérapeute et qui travaille avec des groupes d'hommes violents depuis 25 ans et qui a lui-même beaucoup réfléchi à sa propre masculinité. J'espère que vous pourrez suivre correctement l'épisode et si ce n'est pas le cas, si vous ne parlez pas l'anglais, j'ai cru comprendre que les auditeurs et auditrices d'Histoire de Mec étaient prêts à ajouter des sous-titres sur l'épisode sur YouTube. Je vous mets tous les liens comme d'habitude dans les notes de cet épisode. Oh, et puis dernier truc, désolé pour la mouche, notamment dans la première demi-heure qui se baladait dans mon appartement à ce moment-là, elle fait beaucoup plus de bruit dans les micros que je pensais au moment de l'enregistrement. Bref, merci d'avance pour votre écoute. Si vous aimez ce podcast, abonnez-vous et prenez le temps de mettre 5 étoiles et un cool commentaire sur Apple Podcast, s'il vous plaît. C'est le meilleur moyen de faire connaître le podcast. Et sans plus attendre, je vous laisse en compagnie de Jerry. So, we are with Jerry today. Hello. Bonjour. Bonjour. Extend, my friend. We will release this episode on your podcast. So, sorry for <laughs> your listeners about my French accent. Hello. How are you? The sun is shining and the sky is blue. That's the first <laughs> sentence you learn in French, oh, in really? French school. Yeah. That's more, that's more practical. In England, we learn the cat sat on the mat, which I've never had to use. Okay. So far. <laughs> So far. The first question we ask, I ask all my guests is, what does it mean for you to be a man? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that we do long term, long form yeah. podcast. <laughs> oh, it's such a crazy question, isn't it? And it's one that, interestingly, even though I, I work with men's groups a lot, uh, I'm a therapist, I work, I've worked with men and men's groups for 25 years. It's not something that until recently, maybe me too. Me too. Oh, I yeah. started to ask that question for myself a bit more. Um, before that, it was something that I wasn't. Being a man was something I, I felt, mm. I don't know what it is. I don't know how to be it. Clearly, I'm not living up to other people's standards. Um, and I think the, the, the answer to that is kind of blurry, which is it's, for most of us, I think it's a, something that's forming or reforming. Because what it used to be is no longer acceptable. Okay. And what it's becoming is still something that's evolving. So we had, you know, unfortunately for me, how old are you? 43. Okay, so yeah, you were probably affected by this. I'm yeah. 56. Mm. The, the new man phenomena mm. was a pain in the ass. Because no one really knew what it meant. Well, in what England, do you mean? New, new man was the kind of the evolved man who had feelings and emotions and you know, did housework and stuff like that, as opposed to our fathers. But it wasn't really very formed, it wasn't very defined, and it wasn't very masculine. How old are you? Is it 50, 56. 56. Yeah. yeah, old man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and in England, they have an expression where they talk about something called the, the what's it, what is it, the uh, buffer generation. Buffer is in between. Yeah. Tampon, tampon in, in, in French. Right, no, yeah. that's not the same meaning in English. <laughs> um, the tampon ger generation, I guess, <laughs> maybe. It's maybe. not the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the buffer generation is people of my age, probably your age as well, who where our father's generation are no longer appropriate male role models. Mm. So we are the first men for probably thousands of years, certainly hundred year, hundreds of years, not to be able to look at our father's mm to define what a man is. And this is one of the explanations in England why male suicide is so epidemic. So it's one every four hours, I think, killed, a man kills himself in England. And what? More than uh, cancer, more than heart disease, suicide is the biggest single killer of men. Of, that, of the generation, I think, probably 40 to 60. Okay. It used to be the generation 20 to 40, and they thought it was that age group, and then they realized it wasn't. It was, it was that generation. And so as they grew older, it's still that same, those people born in from the 60s or whatever onwards. So I think the problem is we don't know what a man is. Maybe the next generation, maybe my kids' generation has a better idea. They're, they're very switched on, and they give me hope. Um, and they're, you know, they're not encumbered by gender 
as much as I was. I like this whole kind of fluidity that my kids' generation seem to have and not be... They don't even need, seem to think it through. It's just what they've grown up with, whereas I'm just trying to work it out. You know, what does it mean? Um, How did your gender encumber you, as you say? Well, it was something that I was failing in. Okay. So being a man when I grew up was something that meant you had to be good at sport, you had to be aggressive, you had to be competitive. None of those things interest me at all. You know, in sport, it was like, you really, you, you want to kill me for this ball? Fine, take it, man. I don't <laughs> fucking want it. You take it. That's not important to me. So that kind of spirit it was, you know, obviously disappointing to my father. Of course, an Englishman, <laughs> an English boy doesn't, who doesn't play soccer. Yeah. What and, it is. Um, and, and towards women, I felt ashamed. You know, I'm not a man or I am a man. I, either I'm not enough of a man. Or I'm, or I'm a man and therefore I'm a problem. I'm a potential rapist, you know, I'm a danger. Uh, so it was something that was, yeah, there was, there was no pride in being a man. Uh, was, it, was it already present in your mind that being a man was maybe being a rapist when you were young? I think it was just part of the culture, 1970s culture. Of, oh, yeah. I don't know where I got that from, but it, that was the era where Feminism was really exploding, and I guess I picked it up on the TV or hanging around while my mum sat around with her friends talking about how shit men were, because their men were shit. You know, my dad was cheating and violent and alcoholic and all these, these things, so I would look to him and think, I don't want to be like you, and I'd look to my mum and see how broken she was. So somewhere in there I picked up this kind of political statement that all men are potential rapists. And so I decided not to be a man. It's like, how do I deal with this? Okay, I just be as neutral as possible. Okay. How did you do? <laughs> oh, I did pretty well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, never slept with anyone, didn't have a sex life, you know, didn't, wasn't attractive to women, you know. For real? Yeah. 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 For a long time. Okay. You know, would, ha would have girlfriends, but would be friends with them. Yeah. You know. Okay. Was it okay for you? No, oh. it was miserable. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was horrible, but I didn't know, I had no idea how to be different. You know, there was nothing to look towards. You look at movies and all the men were represented the same. Look to the men, like I say, you know, my grandfather was very gentle. Um, but, so I guess I took as much as I could from him. Um, but in general, yeah, I just tried not to be one. Like, I won't be a threat. I'll just switch it off. And I remember my wife saying to me, you know, your problem is your mother, you have a mother who hates men and a father who hates women. And that was true, you know. Yeah. How did you cope with your father? Uh, Or your father of violence? I don't know. Yeah, I, he wasn't um, physically violent towards me. He was physically violent towards my mum, but I didn't witness that. Everything was a secret in my okay. family. Okay. Um, But I just hid from him and avoided him. But it was easy because he was never there. Okay. So, and then later on when I became a teenager, I started to rebel. Uh, and, but it, yeah, it was always just stay as far away from him as possible. He was, he was frightening to me and my sister. We were both frightened all the time. So okay. I used to be able to hear his car from about 200 meters away and I'd make sure I was in my bedroom before he, his car arrived at the house and there was always a problem when he got a new car because it would take me about oh, yeah. a month or six weeks to listen, learn the sound of the new engine. Mm. But How did you grow up with this frightening father? What, 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 did you, what, did you learn from, what did you learn from him? I learned... Uh, yes, I think that's a difficult question <clears throat> that most men have to face is what did I learn and what did I like that I learned and what did I not like and probably the best learning for me was when I started to recognize if you come from a monster it doesn't feel good mm. so I had to humanize him and I had to find compassion for his damage and see him as a human being rather than a monster And then I was more able to see the things in him that I like, that I appreciate, you know, um, that, that I inherited from him. How did you do that to humanize him? Uh, the main thing was ayahuasca. 
Uh, oh yeah. yeah. Ayahuasca <laughs> helped a lot. Okay. Um, yeah, can, really can can you can you explain what what is ayahuasca? No, no one can. <laughs> <laughs> ayahuasca is a brew. It's a recipe made from two primary plants and some other ingredients that somehow over the millennia the shamans in the Amazon out of the hundreds of thousands of plants that grew there grow there worked out that if you mix it on their own they don't do anything but if you mix them together they make one of the strongest psychedelic medicines imaginable so no one knows how they did that but if you drink it it takes you on a quite a long five six seven hours sometimes um it's like a waking dream so you're you're conscious but you're in a dream state so it's very visionary for me anyway mm. not for everyone but i'm i'm quite visual so uh yeah and it took me the best way i can describe it is it took me inside my father's experience i really oh. got to feel what it's like to be him for a few hours i could almost be him um and really get to experience what damaged him so much Uh, and I remember at one point during the trip, going, oh, fuck, does this mean I've got to have a relationship with him? And the medicine went, no, we're just showing you why he's so hurt that it wasn't your fault, and you don't have to do anything. You don't have to fix him. You don't have to rescue him. He's on his journey. You're on your journey, but his journey is not your fault. His pain is not your fault, you know, because I think most kids, when they have a disappointed father, will think, oh, well, it's because I'm shit at sport or I'm shit academically mm -hmm. you know I'm 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 dyslexic I've got all sorts of learning difficulties so I was a disappointment to him academically and for the same learning disabilities or the fact I just didn't give a fuck about rugby or football <laughs> um, or cricket or hockey or anything um, yeah I, I mean I think most kids go okay I'm a disappointment to my dad so I'm no good you know and it showed me that I that it's that's not the case how old were you When when you had this fifty, what fifty fifty, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> so six years ago. Yeah 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 yeah. So six years ago, because I've been a therapist for twenty five years, and I'd been in therapy for a few years before that. I hit fifty, and I was so broken and so unhappy and so fucked. I was like, really? <laughs> After all, I went to therapy thinking I'll do two sessions and sort myself out, and like. 28 years later, I still feel the same. I'm mean, not the same. I'd grown a lot. I'd learned a lot. But there were fundamental wounds that talking therapy could not touch. Okay. And uh, that was useful as a talking therapist to recognize that and go, okay, I need to find some other tools here. I've never thought that therapy is the answer to everything. Um, so I went and took ayahuasca. And I took a few different plant medicines Um, but ayahuasca, I would say, was the most easy to relate to. The others were like dreams. You know, dreams can be very confusing. So the other medicines I've taken took me longer to understand. Ayahuasca has always been immediate for me. It's, it's, it's a nice relationship I have with that medicine. It's very, very quick. I really understand what it's showing me. Okay. Um, whereas ones like I've taken another one called a boga and another one called 5-MAO-DMT, they can take sometimes years to understand okay and i was wondering because you have two kids mm. two young uh, daughters yeah um, and i was wondering didn't your fatherhood just help you understand your father at the time or maybe project yourself it fucking showed me how much of him was in me oh that was awful i, okay. I remembered when my kids were born It was very difficult because I, you know, most people who have abusive or difficult parents will go, I'm never going to be like them. And then you have kids and you discover how much of them are in you. So that was horrible. That was a very difficult experience to open my mouth and one of my parents would come out. Mm -hmm. And um, I sometimes, I wonder if I romanticize it, but I think there may be some truth that I, I, and I've talked about this with my ex-wife, who I'm very close to um, still, that maybe maybe part of why I left was to protect my kids from oh. the father that I was worried I might be. And I think I've been... It's, it's not that I think it's... 
it would have been much nicer if I could have grown up in the same house as, you know, or they could have grown up in the same house as me. Actually, that's quite a good Freudian slip. Maybe I needed to mm. grow up. Um, <laughs> but um, I think I have a better relationship with them. I don't know that I would like who I was if I'd lived with them all the time. Okay. You know, I have this kind of image in my head w which... Uh, has a phrase which is I keep my father in a cage in my heart and that's what it feels like I feel like there's so much of him in me and I have to keep him in a cage and sometimes not always but sometimes when I'm with my kids and I can feel my irritation and my anger there I, I'm sh I mean I say to them look I'm sorry I'm grumpy and they, they're like you think we didn't know <laughs> so obviously it's there but I don't let it come out and be directed at them which he would have done um, but it's an effort. So I think if I'd lived in the same house as them all the time, I think there'd be a lot more things that I would be ashamed of than I am. And we have a beautiful relationship. So, yeah. You know. So you left to protect them? Like I say, it's a little bit romanticized. Mm. Yeah, maybe. And it's not as simple as that. Mm. But I think there's some truth to that. I okay. think I was very frightened by who I could see was emerging from me, you know, when they were born. Oh yeah, you you did you? I mean, I felt violence yeah. in me. I felt rage. I felt anger, and I I never acted it out, but it was there in a way that shocked me. You know, it was a big wake up. Whoa! Because we all want we all want to be nice dads and better dads of than course. our dads. And yeah, I left when they were two or three, three and four. Okay. Yeah. Um. And yeah, when I was fifty. I don't know. I mean, it's, there's a, again, there's a kind of belief I have in my head that's purely personal, which is, I think that you don't, you don't choose to take ayahuasca. Ayahuasca chooses to take you. Okay. I'd known about ayahuasca for decades. Okay. And I, I knew where to go to take it and I knew who and what have you, but I'd never done it. And one day I just got this very clear knowledge right now. You're coming now. And so I sent the email and I went maybe a week or two later. Oh, yeah? What was the, the point when you... I don't know. No, you don't I know? I was just meditating one day and it was like, right, you, now, here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Okay. Just like that. Okay. Even if you didn't like sports, I guess you're, you, you, you became a rocker. Yeah, I mean, that's a way to be in a team without having to kick a fucking ball around a wet field. <laughs> <laughs> you okay. know, I think, I think, you know, I, maybe it's the same for women. All, all teenagers want to be in a gang, right? Yeah. You know, um, and that was a very natural thing for me was to move towards music and, um, yeah, be in a team to do something collaboratively I think that's a beautiful thing was it a mean for you to I don't know to get to, to express your masculinity not consciously I wasn't conscious no? of anything oh yeah then, at all nothing uh, it was I mean it was it was a, a male band on the whole um, and, and I guess we were we were masculine in our aggressiveness and our destructiveness uh and even in our creativity um yeah there was a violence to us not but not really directed to anyone else but just in our the chaotic way we lived <laughs> okay <laughs> that um i'm not sure that any of the girls that were around would have tolerated okay um yeah and i you know i mean i've got my own theories around that are not through anything I've studied. So someone who's, who's studied anthropology might say it's bullshit, but I've always thought that that impulse to form a band or a football team is a hunting pack in its essence. I think young men, we just have it in our ancestral memory to form packs, whether it's a war party or a hunting pack. And I think it's why rock and roll bands don't usually last very long you know they don't last past your 20s because people don't hang around in gangs much past their 20s it's a it's a young person's kind of way of being because 10,000 years ago when we were hunter gatherers by the time you hit 30 you were an old person yeah you know and well, you probably wouldn't live that yeah 
probably did. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's my thinking around what a rock and roll band is in in its essence. Is it's a, a war party or a hunting pack? You said you were really destructive and you're kind of leading. What does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, um, it was, it we, was, it was we chaos. have, a, I guess, you lived in a way cooler uh, time than me. I, I was born in 1977. Right. And I guess it was the end of the party mm. at the time. Uh, Everyone feels that. Yeah. I, was, I was born in 1964, which meant I missed all the good stuff, and I grew up in the 70s, but by the time I left home, it was 1982. It's the fucking 80s. Oh, yeah. The 80s was shit. Okay. And I, we would sit around going, this is shit. This is the 80s. How can we be in our 20s in this era? You know, we had Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Everything in England was grey. It was colourless, and we couldn't afford to... We, you know, none of us had any jobs uh, through choice. I mean, when I left school, you know, you had to go and see someone to talk about what you would do as a career. And the guy said, don't bother, you're unemployable. And I was quite hurt by that. And it took me about 15 years to realize it was a gift. I am unemployable. <laughs> What do you mean? <laughs> I could never do a job. I couldn't work for someone. And so we didn't even try and get jobs. We just got social security and we would kick the door open of an empty social housing building and move in and live there for free you know we do you have squatting in yeah you must have in paris it's called yeah, squatting yeah, yeah. yeah so we were squatters but because it wasn't our apartment and we always lived in places that were going to be demolished we started demolishing them um so yeah they were broken down buildings with often no water or electricity or heat and certainly no heating you know it was f absolutely so cold And we, any money we had, we would spend on drugs. Um, so we never really had any food. So we were all starving. <laughs> um, and it was wonderful because we just, we would have a drum kit set up in the main room and our amplifiers and our guitars and we would play music all the time. So it was, um, it was a very special time of my life that I look back on with a lot of happiness. Yeah, you seem to. But I show photographs to people and they go, That's, is that London in the war? <laughs> like, well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, why is it a happy time for you at the time? I, you know, it was absolute freedom. Yeah. Uh, no bills to pay, no responsibilities, no reason to get up in the morning. I think I missed daylight for about nine, six months once because I would go to bed at six in the morning and wake up at three in the afternoon and in the winter it was just dark the whole time um and it was exciting it was exciting coming from a very middle class background this was in the east end of london which was very working class very rough uh a very violent place um luckily the gangsters liked us so they we never had any violence done to us because we were looked after um but Yeah, I, I liked the vibe. You know, it was it wasn't pretty, it wasn't nice, it wasn't bourgeois. It was edgy and rough and exciting and you know, there were twenty four hour drug supermarkets and police chasing us and it was wild. And it was very, very creative, you know, because all we did was create. There was nothing else to do, you know. When did it end? Um, when you were 20? <laughs> no, 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 I went on for a long time. I mean, being a musician, you know, living that squat life ended in my mid-twenties, probably just because I moved in with my girlfriend who, who could, you know, get, had a job, <laughs> could have a real flat. And I got bored of being... You know, living somewhere with no water gets boring after a while. Even now, when I walk into my apartment and I switch my light on, it excites me because <laughs> it works. It's like, wow, there's this button that makes power. <laughs> That's fucking great. And I'm glad I lived without that because most people in the Western, you know, European mm. world, most people won't have had that experience. Um, so to live without food, you know, we lived for a long time on flour. You know, we would buy a, ba a bag of flour and we would mix it with water, and we'd fry it and eat it, and it fills you up. There's zero nutrition. 
Ouais. That's, that's weird. OK. Is, it, no. is that British cook? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of chapati. It's more like Indian. But oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. But I'm glad I lived without, you know, because it, I appreciate the life I have now. You know, there's nothing I take for granted. So being warm and dry and... And I think it's really helped me with some of the things I've done recent, more you know, later in life, which are, a lot of them are about deprivation. I take people into situations where they have no food. That's not a coincidence. You know, I will take them into the mountains and leave them on their own for f four days with no food or shelter mm -hmm. because I know the value of having lived like that for years. You have to explain this. You can't, you can't throw, <laughs> throw this like this in. and <clears throat> without context. Uh, well, for a long time, I, I did something that I, uh, is, you know, I think most spiritual practices um, value fasting and solitude. So I created a retreat where um, I would take people out into the wilderness and leave them on their own for days at a time without any food. And then when I discovered ayahuasca, it was like, okay, how do we, where do we go from four days on your own in the woods with no food? How can we make that <laughs> edgy? So let's, let's, let's get them really fucked on ayahuasca for three nights and then leave them on their own in the woods. Uh, um, And, I, you know, that was a little bit scary because I don't like to ask people to do things that I haven't done myself, but I couldn't do it because no one's doing that apart from me. Okay. So uh, I had to trust, you know, because I'd done a lot of fasting on my own in the woods and I'd done enough ayahuasca to understand what I was getting into, but I'd never had the experience together. But my, my instinct said, this is probably a good idea. Um, and it has been. It's been very successful, and I think people seem to get a lot out of it. Did you um, test it first? <laughs> well, not in that, not with that process. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because, like I say, it would have. Yeah. Been, I could have gone and done it on my own. But so we do that in Nepal at the moment. I'm not sure how long we'll keep doing it in Nepal because I'm increasingly ambivalent about flying 30 people around the world for a spiritual retreat and fucking the world up. It seems contradictory mm -hmm. somehow, but. Of course, we couldn't do it this year because of COVID. Yeah, yeah, of course. But it's good to take Westerners away from their comfort zone. And, you know, if you choose deprivation, it's not the same as when it's forced upon you through economical reasons, mm -hmm. or poverty or whatever. That's, that's shit. Um, but if you're comfortable and safe and you've never been uncomfortable, it, it's good for people to go through that. What does it bring to your guests? <laughs> uh, I mean, you'd have to ask them because I think everyone's individual. Um, it depends what they're looking for. For me, like I say, as a middle-class white masculine, you know, male person, I mean, I am the dominator culture, right? Yeah. To go without uh, and to struggle. You know, it's not fun. I mean, it, a lot of it is, but it's an ordeal. And I think um, this goes back to your first question, in a way, what did being a man mean? Um, without rites of passage and rites of passage have always included usually horrible ordeals without an ordeal how do you know how do you test yourself you know and none of us have got fathers anymore that take us out on these these adventures and say right now you are worthy now you are a man so we have to find our own rituals oh yeah and so hopefully what it does for anyone men and women is it takes them to a a more of an adult place in themselves that that would be the the answer to your first question what is a man he's a fucking grown up he's not a little boy in a man costume you know which is for me a lot of the leaders so called leaders mm. in the world at the moment are tiny angry little tantrumy little boys in fat old men suits you know pretending to be men saying i'm the best at this you know and your mother smells it's kind of the the kind of language you hear in playgrounds and yeah probably the most common thing that people accuse Trump of is being like a child. No, he's not like a child. People really need to understand Donald Trump is not like a child. Donald Trump is a child. He never developed, right? He's a little baby in a fucking man costume. And so all of my work for myself, uh, unconsciously, until I realized that was the deal, and all the people I work with, it's 
trying to get them to be in an adult state because that's where we feel good that's where we feel in charge that's where we don't behave like our souls that's where we behave respectfully to ourselves and each other that's what a man is it's just someone who's grown into themselves and you know isn't dangerous because he's fucking freaking out all the time yeah and and you think there's no more rite of passage like like you say where is it I, 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 I was wondering, yeah. You know, the first time you masturbate, the first time you smoke a cigarette, the first time you touch a girl's tits. I mean, really? Is that it? That's, you know, the first time you, you score a goal at football. I mean, it's all these really vague, useless things that have no meaning apart from telling your, your friends that you've done this, you know. Um, a rite of passage usually would have involved a father taking a, a, a child through some kind of ritual and it's if you get through the ritual it's like right you've arrived you've earned this and we're not earning it anymore and i was very disappointed when i hit 18 because i thought i'd wake up and i'd feel like a man and it's like mm. nothing fucking changed and then I, oh maybe it's not till i'm 21 and it's like ah oh, shit nothing changed and then tw you know 30 came and then 40 came it still hadn't happened and i had to do some horrible ordeals to meet myself and find my limits and find, not in a macho way to prove that I'm tough and I can sit in the woods on my own. And that, you know, a boga, which is a really horrible plant medicine, they say it's like meeting your stern father. And it is. I took a boga and he went, fuck off out of here. You're here for the wrong reasons. You're not getting anything. You're here because you just want to tell people you took the strongest medicine mm. in the world. That's that's the macho reason. That's not the right reason. And it kicked the shit out of me. And I just lay there puking for 36 hours, feeling sorry for myself. But it was a really good message. It's like, no, 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 don't do this stuff out of bravado. Don't do it because of some outdated macho yeah. model. You know, do this with humility and do this with respect and do it for the right reasons. I think that was the best message I could have got really I don't think that was a I came away going oh shit that was a waste of time actually it wasn't it was the best thing and I haven't really fallen into a lot of people fall into the plant medicine world and do it a lot because it's exciting and it's you know fun and it's a, it's a it can be a very beautiful experience but as a former drug addict I think Iboga saved me from going down that route and I've not done very much plant medicine because it kind of said don't do this shit stop it you know only do it for the right reasons so i've done ayahuasca seven times and a boga once and five meo twice and that's nothing compared with some of the people i know in the scene who you know i'm not judging them for it that everyone's mm. on their own path but for me i could have done it in a kind of competitive you know, oh, yeah. way to prove to prove something and Yeah, I don't think I'm trying to prove anything because I got what I needed. And I hope I never have to take them again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if I do, you know, if I get summoned, I'll go back. I'll do it again. But Oh, yeah. Each time there's a call. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I took this one. Actually, that's interesting in terms of masculinity. So 5-MeO-DMT is the venom from a toad called the Buffo toad. It's a okay. Californian toad. It squirts venom out of its face. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and you can take the venom and you can dry it and you can smoke it. And it's insanely strong. And I just got, I was writing a book about masculinity, which in the end wasn't about masculinity, but I thought it was. And I got completely stuck. And I had a very strong, strong intuition I needed to, unblock myself with some kind of plant medicine and ayahuasca is very feminine this is this is what's interesting when you get into plant medicine is they have gender okay um or the experience is is of gender so so um oh. ayahuasca is kali it's really fierce female and intelligence is fucking amazingly powerful um whereas a boga is very masculine like they say it's like meeting your strict you know stern mm. father Uh, Buffo was was genderless, but it took me... Everyone I know who's smoked uh, toad venom has a bliss experience okay. where they 
they lose sense of self and become one with the universe. Well, I didn't. I had a horrible experience where I went to hell. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> it was just, well, everything was black. And all I could experience was incredible pain. And I did it twice, both times. Incredible, incredible emotional pain. And it took me to the center of the universe. And at the center of the universe was more pain than I knew was possible. And it said, this is your pain. And that's all right. You don't need to feel ashamed. Being a man who's fragile and delicate and sometimes weak and sometimes broken and in a lot of pain is not something to be ashamed of. It's your father's model is irrelevant. To be fragile and delicate are the qualities that men have denied and been denied for hundreds if not thousands of years. This is as masculine as anything. To be delicate and fragile is masculinity. And that was life-changing. Of course. Because I think I've, I'm someone, like I say, my addictive behaviors over the years have been to avoid pain and to feel ashamed of my pain and to come out of that and go, okay, so there's nothing shameful about this. That, that was a really important teaching. Okay. You, you speak... I come back a um, little backwards, but you, you spoke about rite of passage and you did not mention fatherhood, who can, who can be a rite of passage for, for some men, not for yeah, you? Yeah, not for me. Yeah. No, I knew when I had children, I was 38 when my eldest daughter was born okay. and 40, my second daughter was born. I knew I wasn't old enough. I knew I wasn't mature enough to have children. 38. I really knew I wasn't mature enough and had no choice because my wife was 36. Clock was ticking. Mm. You know, it's like it's now or never. So I, I, and even then, it's interesting. I knew I wouldn't be ready to be a father until I was 50. I don't know why I knew that was the age, but it was true. Okay. Because of, because of, of the ayahuasca? Well, ultimately, that's yeah. what did it. But okay. in my 30s, I had that age in my head. I'm not going to be ready for this till I'm 50. I'm just not going to be mature enough. And okay. I don't think I had the experience that I expected when I was 18 until I was 50, 51, 52. Wow. Okay. Okay. What brings you to, to being a therapist? When, when did you become a therapist? I started training when I was 28. Okay. Started practicing when I was 31. Um, and being a drug addict being a drug addict and going to therapy to do one or two sessions to sort it all out Okay. <laughs> um, and very quickly I thought oh I could do this and in fact this takes the disaster that my life has been for the last 28 years and turns it into a, a part of a skill set you know it's 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 an it, interesting thing to go this in any other context this is a disaster but as a therapist this is your cv you know to <laughs> to have got yeah. learning difficulties and to have been a drug addict and to have lived this crazy life yeah you're not going to get a job in a bank with that that stuff but you're going to be a good therapist because i think the good therapists are the ones who are fucked up but do you want a therapist who's never been through shit i mean i wouldn't trust them I don't know. <laughs> I didn't ask for, for for the CV of my therapist. And now you, you make me ask me, why didn't I ask the CV of my therapist? I, well, yeah, I mean, no one ever asks me. But, I mean, to me, that's important that they know what pain means, that they haven't studied it from a book. You know, it has to be something that you can relate to through your own experience. You know, I say to people, you're not paying me however many euros per hour for an hour, you're paying me for the last 56 years that it would, a lot of which were great and a lot of which were hell. You know, you're paying me to have been to some very dark places and maybe be of use to you because of that. When, when you look at behind you, mm. what makes your life until 28 a mess or miserable, like you say? Well, definitely. I mean, you know, both my parents had Um, a lot of issues 
I went and saw a very, very wonderful craniosacral therapist in Paris, maybe two years ago now. And she was working on my skull and she said, did something happen to your mother when she was, something did something traumatic happen to your mother when she was about six months pregnant with you? And I said, yes, my, my dad left her from another, for another woman. And she went, oh yeah, I can feel it. So, you know, and I, t I totally buy that, that, you know, when we're forming in the womb, we're affected by our parents' experience or my, our mother's experience. So I think it started pre-birth. My mother's an incredibly anxious person, I suspect, from growing up in the war and losing, you know, her father, not losing her father, he came back, but he went away for a long time. So I think having an absent father was probably very difficult for her. Um, I say probably because no one fucking talks in England. Right? No? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I found out recently that my father was sexually abused um, from his sister. Okay. Probably okay. sexually abused. Um, his mother was crazy and had electric shock treatment in the 1940s. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, anyone that walks into my practice room, I know that I'm looking at several hundred years of, you know... Generations? Yes, yeah, multi-generational mm -hmm. trauma and pain mm -hmm. and shit. Um, so, I mean, that's where it started with me is probably 300 years ago. Well, <laughs> um, you know, and you and everyone else. Of course, of course. You know. mm. um, but yeah, you know, those, those kind of issues for my parents, they get transferred to me. You know, I probably learned, not learned, I developed my learning difficulties through these experiences in the womb. Again, I've had ayahuasca experiences that have taken me back there. That, plant medicine is very good for working with pre-verbal trauma, which is you can't work with pre-verbal trauma with a talking therapy because it's pre-verbal. Mm. There's no words, right? It's not until someone learns, that gets to a stage in their life when they can talk, that they can talk about it in therapy. Before that, we have no language. So, so, so the plant brought you back? I've been back into the womb, yeah. I've had memories of being in the womb. Um, and being unhurt I mean that's amazing to go to the place before anything forms you when you're just essence when you're just you before you've got any ideas or beliefs hmm. or attitudes or cultural you know any of that stuff that, that's, that's a good place to get to you know I would say that to anyone if you can get there in, in any kind of therapy to that place that is just the pure essence of you, that's who we are. You know, people talk about the search for the true self. That's probably it. It's where, it's where you're nothing. Yeah. It's before you started to think, well, I'm the kind of person that likes cheese. That's, that's a construct, right, based on experience. Of course. Or I'm not sure that I like Macron's policy. You know, we construct these personas, or even all these tattoos and the clothes we wear and whatever. It's all giving out a message to the world. I'm a rock and roll kind of person, so relate to me like this. It's all manipulative. It's all controlling our environment to say, I'm a bit dangerous, so don't threaten me, or I'm this kind of person, so like me, be attracted to me. You know, we're all manipulating our environment constantly. And to go before that, that's the only thing I know is the true self. Okay. Okay. Uh, th that's so um, uh, interesting. But I, I, I wanted to, to go back to you being a therapist mm. and you are animating, I guess, um, uh, men's uh, group of... I don't know, speak, talking? How, yeah, how do you talking say? Talking circles. Yeah? Talk, talking circles. Yeah. For what now? Tw 20 years? 20, 25 years. Ah, so, so you, you began. Yeah, that's where I started. Oh, okay. Yeah, which is unusual. I just it, was, it, it I was, was lucky. your purpose. I, I was lucky. I got an opportunity to go and work uh, with male, violent men. Um, so it was an organization where I was brought in to run groups. So that was unusual and fortunate for me because a lot of therapists never run groups. I think a lot of therapists are quite frightened by groups, but I started doing groups before I started working with people individually. So it's where my, uh, you know, I started running groups when I 
started a rock and roll band yeah you know that's mm. that's how you learn about group dynamics and egos and that kind of stuff so i was ve- it was very natural for me you know you just it was easier that you didn't have to wait for the drummer to show up um but uh yeah that's now i now i have four groups of eight or nine men that meet usually every other week during covid we met every week on zoom um and they're brotherhoods you know they're very tight in some cases i mean one of the groups is 20 years old yeah they're, it's the same they're family yeah. yeah they're not all the same they weren't all there 20 years ago but most of them have been there for most of that time um and because it's such an old established group even if if you joined you would become part of that 20 year old group quite quickly you know it, it's it's um you can feel the energy because i've i've put them through ordeals you know I've, what did you do same stuff you know ayahuasca oh, yeah. starving them in the woods um <laughs> it's a good way to bond you know and when you've been through shit together you feel tighter you you feel closer and there's a respect that comes from the knowledge that yeah we've all sat out and sat in storms and it's always better when you get a storm i always say to people when they come on my retreats don't pray for sunshine you can get that in your summer holiday pray for really awful weather unfortunately it seems to work (laughs) (laughs) um i was wondering if there's a listeners of this podcast who are violent or aggressive who feel violence or aggressive what are there any listeners of this podcast who won't feel violent and aggressive yeah i guess yeah yeah maybe they can maybe they can call you and tell you tell you how they got there because i don't know anyone who doesn't feel that oh yeah didn't you feel that i feel it i still feel it yeah yeah i mean this is what i mean though i think it's a it's a, the human condition i think we are violent yeah you know but you told me that you try to restrain this mm. anger Yeah. And maybe you can <laughs> feel it and try to restrain it. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I mean, it's it's because it's an effort. Yeah. It, it never ceases to be an effort. I mean, maybe, maybe you know, uh, people might say that's not true for them. So I can't speak for other people, but I can speak for myself uh, and a lot of people that I work with that I think being in charge of yourself is not a place that you arrive at it's something that you maintain it's a practice and there are going to be bad days you know i'm not <sighs> me and my put out a thing during lockdown about managing your violence um for domestic violence yeah i, 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 I will put a, a link yeah in the notes. I mean, it, it got something like a hundred thousand hits or something it was obviously something that hit you know the zeitgeist mm. at the moment And then the next day we went to the shop and I got into a physical fight with someone. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't physical fight like in your Hollywood kind of cowboy, you know, movie fight. But someone uh, got very aggressive. In, it was in the, right in the middle of lockdown. Someone pushed past me. I was pissed off. I, I think I just looked at him pissed off. He started saying he wanted to have sex with my mother apparently okay like, fuck you and fuck your mother um <laughs> and it got very loud very quickly and i felt okay about that and he um he was threatening my he was threatening me he was threatening violence the shopkeeper intervened the guy was very aggressive and troubled now I will usually walk away from a scenario like that, but because he was being threatening physically, you know, he, he was threatening to hit me with his motorcycle helmet. I just stood in front of him and I put my hand on his chest and I pushed him away. And I said, you really are being stupid. There's a two meter rule. Just stop, go away. This isn't going to end well, go away. And he kept threatening to hit me and I knew he wasn't going to hit me. And I didn't feel any violence towards him. I didn't feel like calling him any names. I didn't wish him any harm. But I used my strength, physicality, passion, whatever you want to call it, 
to say, go away, this is not a good idea at a time like this. You know, I know how to use myself energetically to communicate, this is a stupid idea. And I've done that in the past because I'm not very good with bullies. You know, it's probably a throwback to my dad, but I do confront people who are bullying. You know, mm. I did it on in on the street in London where I saw four guys were picking on a black guy and they were poking him and saying, are you going to cry? Are you going to cry? And they were physically... And I intervened and said, leave him alone. I'm not a pacifist. You know, there's there's the, that that is a violence within me that can intervene and say, you fucking go at him and I'm going to help him. You know, is that wrong? I don't know. You know, but there are times when I'm a dick and it doesn't work, you know. There's times when I've used that energy, energy in a not a very positive way or I'm in a bad mood or I'm driving badly and I don't feel good about it. So that's where I question myself. But the thing I say to people all the time that is something I've really worked through is there's, there's clean anger and there's dirty anger. You can use your anger in a very destructive way. You can use it because you feel disempowered and you want to crush the other person. And you, that's when you tend to use violence, physical violence, name-calling. Uh, your whole agenda is to harm the other person so that you win the argument and come out on top. And the, there's clean anger, which is where you communicate something doesn't work. I was pretty clean with this guy in lockdown. He spat on me. You know, that's not very clean anger. He, he clearly wasn't in charge of his, his anger. He's telling me, you know, he wants to fuck my mother and he's spitting on me. Um, but because I've done a lot of work around anger and violence, I know the difference. And I think that's important for people to explore. You know, if, if my anger is just setting a boundary, if my anger is saying, I don't like how you're behaving towards me, go away, back off, step away, not otherwise I'll kick the shit out of you because I've never kicked the shit out of anyone. I don't know how to. But just go away, right? Fuck off out of my face. This is not working for anyone. That's a good thing to do because otherwise it's like you got no door on your house. Anyone can walk in and help themselves to your stuff. You have to be able to say no effectively um, as opposed to going out looking for fights, which some people, will, you know, this guy obviously did. He was looking for a fight. Maybe he was pissed off with lockdown. Or, you know, I don't know what was going on for him, but in your... Ang anger and violence are incredibly hard to manage. You know, it, it takes a lot of self-awareness to recognize the purity and the, the, en the, the forceful energy that is pure and as opposed to it being out of control and destructive. You know, it's taken me, yeah, 25 years working on that and you um, i'm not even sure if it's coming across clearly now you know it's a hard thing to describe because we're talking about an energy which is invisible yeah you worked a lot about shadow mm. uh, you you wrote you wrote a book about shadow um can you can you tell me more about the shadow i mean that on my wall in my apartment i've written a, a, fr a phrase by Carl Jung which says do you want to be good or whole and I think that's really what it comes down to <laughs> you know we're all trying to be good I was trying to be a good dad mm. trying to be a, a good man a good person whatever well that requires that you ignore the monster in you and you ignore the rapist in you and you ignore the killer in you and you pretend it's not there and you spend your life being nice and It doesn't work. Or if it does, it's it's hugely compromising to you as a whole. To me, your shadow, and your shadow is, you know, we we kind of need to rebrand it because shadow sounds so dark. Yeah. And actually, it's where your brilliance is. It's where your gifts are. It's, about, it's, it's your unconscious. It's where anything that you've denied in yourself. And particularly, you know, I think maybe it's the whole of Europe. Um But we're not encouraged to say we're brilliant, you know. So that gets buried in the shadow. And in, in England, to to be boasting about how great you are, you know, like again, Donald Trump, he's, mm. he has no uh, filter when it comes to saying I'm amazing. And this is one of the reasons I think he's so offensive to people in Europe because we consider that a really uncultured thing to do. 
Um, but yeah, your your brilliance is in your shadow as much as your murderer is in your shadow. What do you mean by your brilliance is in your shadow? For me, I guess I I could say my brilliance is my is in my good side. Your brilliance, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Muhammad Ali could not have come out of England, right? I remember when I was a kid, I was so offended by Muhammad Ali. I was maybe five or six years old. And suddenly there's this guy on the TV saying, I am the best in the world. Like, what? You, you can't say that. <laughs> you can say your shit. You can say, oh, no, it was nothing. You know, it's not. I mean, in French, right? You say to someone, thank you. And they go, de rien. There it yeah. is. It was nothing. Mm. Well, maybe it was something actually. Why? Yeah, but culturally, you've been trained to say, oh, it's nothing, to dismiss it. Okay. That's what I mean. It, to say, actually, no, it was really good. That was a really good thing that I did. And I know that I'm a really good painter, or I'm a really good singer, or I'm a really good artist, or I'm a really good accountant, or whatever. We're not encouraged to celebrate. It's really about celebrating. You know, and I don't think people, I, I, hopefully, my kids feel celebrated, but I think. If you celebrate people, they grow up feeling confident. Um, and also, you want to be able to be accountable so that you want to you wanna raise people who can say, yeah, you're right, I know I can be really selfish sometimes. Because they, they know they've been into their shadow. And they've gone, yeah, I've got a selfish side. I'm familiar with that. Or I've got a side that's greedy. Or I can be really mean. You know, when I'm hungry, or if I haven't slept well... I, I've got a really nasty side that comes out. Of course, I'm a fucking specialist in this. I'm called Mr. Hyde, right? I don't know if you have this <laughs> this story in France, but Dr. Jekyll and yeah, Mr. Hyde, it's the dark side. Yeah. It's not why I explored it, but, you know, <laughs> it's it's not a coincidence. Wow. Um, and <laughs> if you know I these never, sides... I, I never related <laughs> That's so amazing, <laughs> of course. But if, you know, if you, um, if you know Mr. Hyde in you, you're in charge. And... I'm always hesitant to mention Jordan Peterson because he's so contentious, particularly to kind of people who are part of, I guess, you know, a, a woke generation, a woke community. I understand why people really dislike Jordan Peterson. I don't think he's the most sensitive person in, in the delivery of his messages, but I think he's very articulate in some of his teachings. And he talks about the shadow very well. And he talks about... Can you can you just uh, tell about Jordan Peterson? Jordan Peterson is um, he's a Canadian academic. He's a professor. I think he's a clinical psychologist. I might be wrong on that. Okay. He's upset a lot of people, um, particularly around gender. And you know, he says some to me unuseful things. Like he'll say, "There's no such thing as white privilege. There's no such thing as male privilege." Um, I don't think I see those are useful mm. statements. I understand some of his arguments. But he talked about the shadow through some of the lectures he did from the New Testament. And he talks about Christ's Sermon on the Mount, where Christ said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And he said he didn't understand why that would be the case. Why the fuck should the meek get the earth? <laughs> What have they done? Mm. So he, as an academic, explored the... Um, the ancient scriptures, the original scriptures, the Hebrew and I think ancient Greek scriptures that the Bible was originally written mm -hmm. in. And he said they've been mistranslated, or this piece has been mistranslated. A truer, more accurate translation would be, blessed are they who bear arms, know how to use them, and keep them sheathed, for they shall inherit the earth. So someone who has a weapon knows how to use it, but chooses, has the mastery, the self-discipline, the self-awareness not to be violent with it, to keep it in its mm -hmm. sheath. And again, back to your first question, what is a man? Someone who is dangerous, has mastery over it, and therefore doesn't use that force for harm. That's a man to me. It's also a woman. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, it's mm. not exclusive. But for me to to attend, that's that's something I can understand because I know the danger of my father. I know the danger within me, and on a good day, I know how to keep it sheathed. On a bad day, I just go and sit by myself. You know, <laughs> it's not that on a bad day I'm running around hurting people, but mm. 
I can do. I can insult people and I can offend people and I can be insensitive and thoughtless and all those things. And so when that happens, because I've explored that side of myself, I'm less likely to be defensive. Mm. Sometimes I can be because I also know I'm defensive uh, because I don't like to make mistakes. But when I do, I, I endeavor to say sorry rather than go, fuck you, it's your fault. You know, yeah. it never ends well. <laughs> I see why. <laughs> <laughs> you can see why. Um, one, I guess, one of the main problems today with um, masculinity is one of my guests just told me maybe three three episodes ago that he was afraid to go in that box where all the maybe the dark side of his masculinity uh, uh, is. Mm. And, um, yeah, you he, should be frightened. Yeah, and he <laughs> said, I don't want to open it. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to look in it mm. because maybe I did things I wouldn't be really proud of in my past. Um, what would you say to him he was, if he was here? Yeah, I'd say, okay, get a really big hammer and some big nails because you're going to need them to keep the lid on that box for the rest, <laughs> rest of your life, man, because that's what you have to do. If you don't want to go in there, you've got to be on the run forever because at any moment that box can burst open and I cheated on my wife when I was 42 that's the last thing I would have bet my children's lives I will never cheat my father cheated throughout his life he's always cheated I will never ever cheat because I will never be like my father so when I cheated it was like who the fuck is this I don't even know myself and that's because I hadn't opened that box I'd opened that box and looked at kind of had a peek and seen there was some violence in there that I needed to look at and some anger issues that I needed to look at. I didn't even bother looking to see if there was any possibility of cheating because that's not who I am. And that's the problem when you don't look is it can, it can sneak up on you. You know, so it's, I think it's always better to go and look and put a fucking great spotlight in there and really look into all the, co in the, all, all the corners because then you're not going to be surprised by what you find and you have an opportunity to choose whether to be it or not. But as long as you're avoiding it and in denial because you're frightened of what, you know, it's horrible. I, I want to be a nice guy like everyone else and there's all sorts of sides of myself in there that have been very, very challenging. But what are you going to do? You know, I don't want to be running my whole life. Yeah. I guess we'll finish on this. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, quick, put the fucking box on. Shut the whole thing down. <laughs> It's getting too uncomfortable. <laughs> That was nice, man. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. It was so nice. I hope your your listeners excuse, excuse me for my poor English, of oh, course. Well, excuse me for my non-existent <laughs> French, and I apologize to all your listeners for being a typical English. People don't learn other languages; we just shout oh, in yeah. English. Well, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> What about? What is the point? <laughs> um, uh, hopefully, um, one of my readers just told me uh, if we upload the video on YouTube, uh, maybe maybe someone can just make the translation and yeah. the subtitles yeah, yeah. maybe yeah. so thank you so much pleasure and we put all the the links for your instagram and your podcast your very own podcast yes. uh okay. so so my my guests will my readers my listeners sorry will be able to to listen to cool. your thank job. you thank you